we thought if we build the market up here, then eventually there'll be enough work for everyone. Business of Architecture, episode 411. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that empowers you to do your best work more often. This podcast is a production of Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps firm owners structure their practice and their teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Today's interview is with Michael Porras, principal of McIntosh Porras Associates, an architecture firm with offices in Birmingham and Detroit, Michigan. Porras and his firm are passionate about the revitalization of his hometown of Detroit. His leadership has evolved the firm into a full-service practice, offering a range of disciplines in architecture, interior design, and urban planning within diverse project types. Here's the interview of Ryan Willard with Michael Porras. Michael, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Good. Thank you. Brilliant to have you here. Now, you are the founder and um, one of the partners here at Macintosh. Porris Associates, which is based in Detroit, and you've done an incredible array of iconic commercial work, hospitality, residential architecture, um, adaptive reuse. You've had an extraordinarily interesting uh, career where you've worked at, you've worked with Frank Geary, you've worked with Tom Main, um, and it's, you know, and then, then relocated to Detroit. So again, you've worked on the different coasts uh, in the US and then founded your own your own company. I guess the first question was, what have been some of the lessons learned from some of those practices like Geary's and, and uh, Morphosis that have stayed with you in the creation of your own company? Uh, many. Um, I, I basically had 10 mentors instead of one, and it was somewhat intentional. Uh, the first firm I worked at here in Detroit was a spinoff of Yamasaki. And it was for partners who had worked at Yamasaki's for 25 years. And, and uh, you know, I worked there for two summers and, you know, they started their own firm later in life. And, you know, they, they had kids and, you know, they had a lot of things they had to support. So it made their focus, you know, really much more like they had to make income and it was very developer focused and, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on them for that. And I thought, you know, plus they worked for Yamasaki for 25 years. Mm-hmm. So that's what they knew. And, and which it was a great experience. I learned a lot. But then um, I went to Caesar Pelley's uh, for two years. And, and Caesar's was, you know, everything I did after was measured against that. And, and Caesar's office was run like Saranen's office. Um, where Caesar had worked for 10 years and, and uh, very collaborative, very, um, very much everyone working on the projects had input into it. And, and Caesar's idea was, you know, if you've got three or four people working on a project, they're working on it every day, you know, 10 hours a day where, you know, he's looking at it maybe once a day. So he took what people were doing very seriously and, and, um, really acted more like a studio director, like in school than, than, you know, sketching. He didn't sketch. That was a whole other thing. So right. he reviewed things and, um, but it, it was very good. And so it made me as a young designer, you know, really excited to work on stuff and very much part of what we were doing and, and, uh, you know, learned a ton. I think I've worked on 40 projects. Um, now, it, it, so when I went to other places like Gary's, uh, Gary's work was about Gary. It was his work. Um, he was sort of the opposite of Caesar. He didn't necessarily want your input. There were a few people in the office that he worked directly with. Um, everyone else, we were there to sort of, you know, build his models, you know, translate his sketches. And this was still when it was all hand. And, and that was fascinating too, because trying to figure out how to, you know, build a sketch or, you know, translate it was very interesting. Um, but he didn't necessarily want your input. It mm-hmm. was clearly his. And um, 
you know, so that was very interesting, but it was, it was, uh, it was different than Caesar's. And then Morphosis um, was much more like Caesar's. Um, and, and I think partly because Tom Main worked at Grun in the 60s uh, when he was like right out of school and Caesar was the head of design there. So, you know, I think, um, I feel like his office uh, had a connection back to that is the way we worked at Marxist was very similar to how Caesar worked and, and, you know, very much the work was the sum of everyone working on it um, uh, versus just, you know, a designer. And, uh, and that, you know, as an employee, as someone working there, it was very exciting, um, you know, enough to make you work, you know, 70 to a hundred hours a week because mm-hmm. it was really enjoyable. Um, and that was, you know, uh, those were definitely um, huge for me. Uh, the other piece to that was listening, um, listening to the client, um, you know, in a way like Caesar's work and Saranen's was came out of each project. Like it wasn't a language like Gary's or Myers, let's say. Um, and so it, it, each project was really kind of starting new. Theoretically, um, Morphosis was like that as well. Uh, so the dialogue, the work came out of this dialogue and uh, in the office. But it was, to me, it was very much in the office. Um, and it didn't, it, it you know, I, most of the projects I worked on didn't get built. Um, you know, this was much earlier. I mean, obviously it's gone on done quite a few things, but, um, but the, what I learned was if you're going to start a project with no preconceived idea and go from there and, you know, as a priority, like you know, no, no idea of what it's going to be, let the process lead. Well, how about if you include the, the client in that process and the, the builder and what you got to do in the city, because that's all, contributing to the final thing. And so um, that's kind of what we, that's really what I've done here. That, that was my goal. Um, it's more complicated process in a way. And you have to give up your ego because, you know, client may want to go a direction that you don't necessarily want to go, but, um, but it's allowed us to get a number of things built you know, budget is a very important thing. And I think a lot of architects look down on this, like it's a sellout, Um, but this is Detroit and Detroit has been depressed for 50 years, 60 years. Um, And our goal was to build here, to make a difference. And to build here, it's a a much more um, economically sort of depressed city you know, it's had a rough time for a long time. And uh, so we had to deal with much lower budgets and, and, you know, a lot of things to just get things built. And at a certain point, that was our goal more than, you know, creating sort of a architecture. Um, and, and I, you know, that, yeah. So it, there was a little bit of, a little more social um, point of view. Got it. So, so that's that's very interesting. The different perspectives you've got from each of those, you know, pretty preeminent architects um, of their of their of their times, and um, very different working practices from from each of the firms. Um, yeah. it, when you look at a practice like Geary's, you you know you see him as the star architect if you like the main figurehead and you you know how you've described that how that process works kind of is in alignment with that which of the businesses were and, and again you, you bring up this very interesting point about getting work actually built was any of those practices that that you felt or some of the working the design processes made it more difficult to get projects built um Yes and no. I mean, Gary's and Myers, you know, people are coming to them with an expectation that they're going to do their work and they know 
uh, for the most part, um, you know, more recently, they know it's going to be expensive. Um, so they're, although Gary is, was still focused on budget, um, mm -hmm. his earlier work, like that was a lesson he always said, learn to work in the market, you know, young architecture to learn to work in the market. And I think, you know, that represents his whole early um, experience. So that never went away. So budget, like Bill Bow is, there's a lot of economy in that. Yeah, it actually came in on the budget, didn't it? As a, as a right, yeah, and it, you know, there's, there's, I mean, it, you don't realize it, but it actually was, um, you know, the the budget was a consideration in how it was done, and mm -hmm. that's that's a big achievement. Um, I think, you know, often though. You know, let's Meyer or some of these places. Let's say you're doing a house, your fee might be 25% of the construction budget. Um, you know, and oh, by the way, the budget has to be over you know certain amount of money. So, you know, so you're you're setting yourself up to work for the a teeny percentage of the population. Um, I mean, I and I, you know, I think um, again, if the, if the process is insular. And you know you're working away on this design, and you develop something, you know, really spectacular and very contemporary. And then you take it to the client and show them. You know, you risk this sort of: are they going to like it or not? Right? And 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 often it was too developed, um, so they they look at it and it's like they don't really feel like they were part of it and you know and they sort of put it aside and go on to someone else maybe partly because they don't want to offend you and this I saw this happen um, and you know again like that's that's a different way of working than really working with your client through the programming really understanding like what the goals are you know how it fits in the city with the master plan the planning mm. department like there's you know really getting all of that input before you put pen to paper and, um, you know, and, and budget. I mean, I, I think, you know, those are, those are big part of our projects and we're constantly looking at that as we go through so that we don't end up with something that's, you know, blows the budget and can't get built. Yeah. Everyone walks away. Um, and again, it's, 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 a, it's challenging. Um, you know, does it all end up being stuff that's on the cover of architectural record? No, but that's not necessarily my goal. Mm. Um, so what, what brought you to Detroit of all places? Is, is it a, a place that you've had a heritage with or connection with previously? Yeah. So um, I actually grew up here. Right. Um, and uh, my late business partner, Doug McIntosh, and I grew up here uh, in a, a neighborhood in Farmington Hills that Carl Koch uh, designed uh, and uh, he's the grandfather of prefab. So we grew up in prefab houses from the fifties, um, honestly not realizing it at the time. Um, and uh, it was a great neighborhood. It was full of creatives and, and you know, people from the auto industry and stuff like that. So we, you know, we grew up and left. Um, I, I went, I lived in Israel. I, was in Ann Arbor, New Haven, LA, Japan. Um, and when I came back, uh, Doug had gotten a project here. He was in New Haven. Um, and I was out on my own in LA and he, 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 all of our friends had left pretty much. Um, so he convinced me to come work with him on a house for a few weeks. And when I came, um, we went downtown Detroit and, you know, it was, it was empty. This was 1994. You could shoot a cannon down Woodward Avenue and nobody was there to notice. There were 90 vacant buildings downtown. And, uh, and it, you know, it was really kind of the, the bottom of where Detroit went. And, you know, we looked at it and we thought, um, wow, this is like Berlin after the war. This is like Beirut or Havana, you know, and we thought we could make a difference here. Um, and we decided, you know, this was where we as young architects should be. Um, 
versus being on the coasts, you know, or New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, and in cities where we, we basically had the saying, you know, they're done, they're baked, they're out of the oven. You know, yeah, you can keep adding sprinkles, but, you know, they're, they're great places already. And Detroit really needed like a lot of work to get it back to that. It had the bones somewhat, you know, it had a lot of sort of great early 20, early 20th century architecture still it was, and uh, it, it had a lot going for it, the, in, the industry, the history, uh, the design history is like phenomenal and it had been completely lost on mm. people. And so you know, that kind of, you know, that, that basically made us move here um, for good. And when was this? Was this around about 94? Yeah. I first came in October of 95 and I, or 94 and I moved here uh, permanently in uh, sometime in 95, summer of 95. I was commuting between LA and Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a journey. <laughs> it was. <laughs> so, so you and Doug didn't know each other previously in Detroit, but you knew each other. No, we grew up together. Oh, you grew up together. Sorry. We grew up in the same street in this development called Holly Hill Farms, which is now people are noticing it because it was a sort of tech built Carl Coke design and you know prefab like a very early prefab and and uh, people are starting to recognize it great sort of mid century houses and um, so but up until now nobody's paid attention to it but mm-hmm. so that was a really good interesting place to grow up you know we all had great you know Eames and Noel and Herman like we all had really sort of modern furniture and you know everyone in the, in the neighborhood there were car designers there were graphic designers who went to Cranbrook like right across the street like there was it was this little hub and it was you know everyone we grew up with had had this furniture so if I'd go to someone else's house and they had like colonial it was like oh what what's this you know of course we thought there was something wrong with us like why do we have such different stuff but um turned out you know it was great Amazing. And so what was, what were some of the early projects when you and Doug first kicked off the, the, the practice and how did you go about winning work? Uh, well, our first project here uh, was a house renovation and interiors. It was a Gunnar Burkert's house where Gunnar Burkert's had done, I want to say in like early sixties um, and, he had been at Serenon for a long time as a designer. And uh, this was a new house he did. I can't remember the name of it, but it, at the time it was rec- it was in record. It was published a lot in 60, early 60s. And the new owners had one of the largest collections of antique lolly glass in the world. And um, they had interviewed a number of architects and Doug's mother uh, basically made a pitch to her at the beauty salon uh, when she was getting her hair cut for Doug, like about Doug. And uh, I went back in the back room and called him up and said, get your ass on a plane and get here. And uh, it was pretty funny. She went home and changed her answering machine to Doug Smack Dr. Associates and, uh, <laughs> and basically set up a meeting with uh, this client, uh, Lori Shapiro, and he got the house. I mean, he got it, you know, it worked because the, the Burkert's connection to Saranen and you know, Doug's connection to working for Caesar, it was a very, uh, and, he, you know, he'd gone to Yale. I mean, it was, there was an understanding of the, the collection and the house. And so that was the first one. And it was redoing the interiors uh, really for the collection. Um and yeah, that was, that was a great project. That was the first one. And then that led to others um, uh, in that sort of circle of, you know, higher wealth, um, you know, Bloomfield Hills sort of, um, uh, anyway, yeah, that, so that uh, we started getting more of those. So that's how we were supporting ourselves initially. As, as the residential work. And honestly, it was a way for us to just learn, build and grow, you know, build and learn 
you know, outside of the fishbowl of LA or New York, where, you know, you have a thousand other architects looking at everything and you know, it's super critical here. We could make mistakes and, you know, um, and figure out, well, wh what is the architecture of Detroit, yeah. of Michigan versus, you know, LA? Like I, I really didn't want to bring LA to Michigan. It didn't seem like it was really like, well, what is it of this place? So that was interesting too. So with the initial kind of residential projects that you were, you were doing, then what came after that? How did you begin to expand and develop the business? Um, boy, it was, well, a few things. Um, it, it, we, we got a commercial project in Ann Arbor doing uh, um, offices for uh, um, Charles Gelman of Gelman Sciences. And he, he owned a um, company he had grown like from his basement to 900 employees. And, um, you know, fascinating sort of scientist. And so we started out doing his office and meeting with him you know, came to realize like, you know, they were in like a bunch of different buildings and they'd just grown over time, like without really thinking about the whole thing. And we were putting people in the basement. And, and uh, so we, um, you know, we, we started talking to them about doing a master plan to like really plan out like how they grow. And uh, we did that. And that was, that was a good project. Didn't get built at the time. Years later, a lot of it did, but um and then, but the bigger thing was in Detroit. We, uh, we, we started doing a lot of advocacy in Detroit uh, first to just save the buildings from being torn down. Right. You know, that was like in 95, there was a proposal on the mayor's desk, Mayor Archer, to demolish all the buildings on the east side of Woodward from Grand Circus Park to... Um, um, Campus Marshes, uh, which was absurd because Grand Circus Park and Campus Marshes were both already big parks. And, uh, it, and, uh, and these were all like amazing early 20th century buildings from when Detroit was Silicon Valley. And um, so we, we, we started a lot of advocacy. We got on a committee actually with the mayor's office to figure out an alternative to that. The mayor's feeling at that time was why don't we have Soho? What, you know, why he didn't necessarily want to tear them down, but that's what people were telling him, including architects, honestly, at that time, like local art. So we were like, what the hell's going on? So, <laughs> so, um, so we did, we came up with a plan working with them for six months for, you know, converting that sort of downtown center. Um, it's called the necklace district um, with the 90 vacant buildings into a commercial sort of mixed use residential and cultural center. And we, you know, we, we looked at a lot of other cities where this was happening, um, you know, office buildings being converted and, and um, you know, it's 95 uh, and basically created a roadmap for that, that then started the process, uh, the mayor's office and created the downtown partnership um, as a, as an entity that could start this process. Right. Um, so, uh, which was great, you know, then they, they um, but it was a rough project uh, process to say immediately, like the first thing I announced was they were going to tear the Hudson's building down. And we were like, what, you know? <laughs> so then we had to fight that. Um, and then, you know, we fought that being torn down. We fought, they got torn down. We fought the, the book Cadillac getting torn down and that one, one got redeveloped. Luckily um, we helped save the Michigan central depot. This was in the early two thousands from getting demolished. And our thing, our thing back then was keep the buildings, mothball, let them stay until the market comes up, which now it has 25 years later, it's, it's there. And, and those 90 buildings are mostly renovated. Now that's happened. Much of that happened in the last 10 years. So it took a while, but the, you know, it was really like there were already 40 vacant miles of, of uh, land in the city. Were you ever involved in the, in the development side of some of this? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, well, the whole time we were advocating, we were, you know, uh, getting clients and um, our, yes. Yeah, so our, our, at the time in the early 90s, the people doing development were nonprofits like community right. development corporations. So we actually did a, a master plan for them in a neighborhood where you know, there hadn't been a permit pulled in 20 years. There was literally um, maybe 40. It was a long time. There was a handful of people living in the neighborhood, uh, but there were these amazing buildings, including the Paquette plant, which is where Ford invented the, um, you know, created the the line. You know, the I mean, it's sort of a very. I thought it was the most important building in the city. It was on the demolition list at that point, as wow. were buildings next to it, which were the Studebaker factory. Like this was the birthplace of the auto industry. Yeah. And, uh, and that neighborhood, when we looked at it, we were really interested in those buildings, you know, to be lost. Um, what we found was you couldn't really address those until you took on the whole neighborhood. So we did a master plan for this community development group that was the church in that neighborhood. And, um, um, and built the first phase, which was 89 units. Um, the Paquette plant was taken off of the um, uh, demolition list. It's, it's still there. It's a nonprofit now who's really um, you know, brought it up, renovated it. And now, you know, 25 years later, that neighborhood is finally uh, seeing um, the fruits of that from 25 years ago and that we're doing uh, Fisher 21 uh, building now, which is a 600,000 square foot industrial building that was in that neighborhood, just sitting there for 40 years vacant. Um, and we're working on that right now. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, that's an example. And then, you know, the projects downtown, yeah, we were, we were walking through so many of those vacant buildings for years, all through the, 90s and into 2000s, doing proposals for people, trying to get people interested in doing work downtown, mm. developing work. Because at the time, it was, you know, it was really hard. Um, it was a hard process. The, it just, you know, no one could figure out how to do it financially, uh, make it possible. Um, you know, we 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 helped get um, tax credit, the historic tax credits. Uh, passed at the state level in 1999, and that really helped to create a um, um, it, that on top of the federal tax credits made it feasible to renovate these buildings, and right. that, uh, that was a big thing. So a lot of our work, like this, is where it's like it's not design with a you know or architecture with a capital A. It was like backing up and like working from like, how do you even get people interested to start doing these from a financial point of view? Um, we also did the, the Park Avenue plan, which, so this was 96 and Detroit's fascinating place. So Detroit, the um, casinos were voted in in 96. And so, um, so all of a sudden everything stopped because nobody knew where they were going to go. So there, we had some development starting in 95, 96, people interested in buildings. And then it just stopped because nobody knew where these three casinos were going to go. And they, you know, they didn't want to do something on their property if they were going to hit the lottery and get a casino on, you know. So, um, so during that planning process for the casino, um, casinos and district, which took a long time, um, we started looking at other things. So Park Avenue, there was a baseball stadium, Comerica Park, for the Tigers planned originally on the west side of Woodward behind the Fox Theater. And in that plan was basically to demolish everything in that neighborhood, uh, including on Park Avenue, which had been a really great street in Detroit, like historically, like where a lot of clubs and things were, but mm way back, like jazz clubs and stuff. Um, so we developed a plan called the Park Avenue plan where we, kind of from a financial point of view, we looked at 
the revenue generated by the cost and the revenue. If you tore down those buildings and built surface parking lots, you'd create, you know, X number of jobs, 15 jobs for those parking attendants and this much revenue for the city, where if you save those buildings and renovated them and, you know, create housing, it was like you create this much, you know, jobs and, and revenue and all sorts of things for the city. And, and oh, by the way, you can use tax credit. So we, we laid this out as an as a example. Again, it was really financial model. And, um, you know, it, it stuck. And um, it, it led to uh, Tiger Stadium being moved to the east side of Woodward and um, Park Avenue not getting torn down. Um, and, you know, and, and the, I think the first building renovated there was the Kales building. So um, did we get all these projects? No. Um, we never thought we would. We thought if we build the market up here, then eventually there'll be enough work for everyone. So, we, again, we had to give up our ego and say, you know, it doesn't matter if we get all of these. We want to build this up so that eventually – there's a lot of work for a lot of people. So, this is amazing. This is amazing to hear this. So essentially you, you were kind of, you know, part of its advocacy. Part of it is actually doing business development and, and forecasting and you know, coming up with a business plan, then finding developers who might be appropriate to, you know, to, to build and finding other ways that finance could be released. And I, I, I guess this is, the the overarching mission was not yeah it wasn't self serving well it was in a way but it was really it, there was, was an overarching of like you know we're doing this for everybody because then we'll get we'll get some splash back as well yeah that that was that was our concept I mean you know unfortunately we made a lot of enemies like in the nineties trying to save all those buildings sure against people at the DGC and the and the government because. And back there, like the head of planning and the head of the DGC, Georgia Economic Growth Corporation, like they would say things like, if a developer came to us tomorrow and wanted to build a Walmart on Woodward Avenue, you know, we would do that. They would tear down everything and build a Walmart right downtown. And it was all about the money. Like they just wanted somebody to come invest in the city. They, they, it didn't matter what it was. Uh, they just, it was like they needed development and they didn't, you know, so planning went out the window and, you know, that was horrible. So we were fighting that for quite a time, quite a while. And, um, you know, in the long run, a lot of those people we were fighting back then are now our clients. Um, and then a lot of the people who, you know, were knew what we were doing are also our clients now, you know, 25 years later, the ones that are left. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was really interesting, and it was definitely far from doing sort of high architecture, high design. You know, I mean, I I know I can do that. You know, given a enough budget and mm -hmm. enough time to you know to put towards you know ten people build, working on something for thousands of hours. Yeah, you can do that. It's much more of a challenge to try to do it in a market. And especially in a depressed market where, um, you know, how do you get things built um, that aren't necessarily for the top one-tenth of one percent? You know, how do you do stuff for the other 99 percent? And and honestly, that's more important. And and I feel like I we also felt like that was a part of modernism, mm. you know, early like earlier 20th century modernism that may have gotten lost along the way. Yes. And I, you know, and I, I, unfortunately I think that's lost on, you know, the stuff we are taught, you know, we look at and, and then, you know, we, you know, you go from like, you know, we're just busy looking at this stuff all over the world. Well, the people we're building for in Detroit, they don't know any of that. You know, they, they actually, what they know is often very little. It's not a educated city and, you know, they know what they, what they Experience. So, um, so you have to try to take that in, keep that in mind when you're doing stuff. Mm. It's like, and I, I think, you know, we often architects like just, you know, we're so busy wanting the thing to be, you know, this 
the next architecture. And, and it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's not, I, I just don't think it's the right way. And I think I was just reading about uh, Brad Pitt's Make It Right project. Yeah. I remember seeing, and I went to um, New Orleans years ago when it was still being built. And, um, and honestly, I was, you know, while some of the houses were interesting as objects, as a neighborhood, it was a total failure. Like mm-hmm. the way they worked, they didn't work together. And, you know, a lot of them were, you know, just, it just was like, they're great objects, but they're not going to last. And now here we are, there's just a rec- an art, uh, uh, article in Architectural Record about, yeah, like, like it's falling apart and there's lawsuits and, you know, a lot of the houses have had to be abandoned and, you know, and it, and it's really like, was that a great idea? Cause even at the time, I remember, you know, the, the budgets were this much, the houses were costing, you know, two times the budgets and, you know, somehow they were doing it, but, you know, this was for people that are not really wealthy. They have to keep the house up. Yeah. But they didn't really have that. So there was a lot of, you know, like it could have gone a different way. And, um, and I think that gets lost, you know, um, often, and it's a really good lesson. And, you know, and again, I mean, I worked for a lot of those firms, but I guess there's a, I'm more concerned with the social aspect yeah, and actually making a difference. Um, what was, was, was your interest in the social aspect or, you know, was it kind of more concreted or made more certain from your experience in working in the, in a kind of the, the traditional star architect firm, if you like, because it's almost like a, you know, it's, it's very, it's quite a contrast. Yeah. Well, so I worked at a or lot. Is it? So, <laughs> no, no, it, it, it partly came out of that. Cause that's, yeah, I was at. Caesars and Morphosis and Gary's and Meyer and Frank Israel's. And, you know, um, the last place I worked before I went out on my own was a place called the Nadel Partnership in LA. They were much more of a commercial firm. It's like 200 people. There were like seven of us in the arc in the design department. The rest were production. And, you know, the example I always use is, you know, we were given a golf club to design and, you know, we had 60 hours to design this golf club, a week and a half, one person, right? Um, I'd worked on a golf club at Morsus, the Chiba golf course in Japan. And uh, I think the schematic design, you know, was probably 10 or 20,000 hours, right? And I mean, you know, it's a lot, wow. 10 of us working on it for, yeah. you know, a year. And it's like, uh, I mean, it was amazing. And, you know, giant details of everything. And um, ultimately it didn't get built. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and I mean, obviously the, the quality of that was amazing, but the reality of doing work in the market, you know, when you start out, you're not necessarily going to get Bilbao or a museum or this, like we train for all that, but you know, you're getting houses, you're getting additions, you're getting restaurants, you, you know, you grow. So um, I figured, well, I had that sort of bigger experience behind me than doing the houses and growing from that, like we could grow into the larger work, which, you know, we're doing, but um, uh, yeah, I I just, it was a fascinating um, lesson. You know, when you start working on your own, you really get it. Yeah. You know, you got to make it work and you're getting paid to make it work. And, you know, early on, you're not really getting paid a lot. So you got to figure out how to do it in a certain amount of time, unless you want to be the starving artist architect, which is sort of the model that, you know, we're all given. And that's great if you're teaching to subsidize your firm. Yes. You can do, you know, do this stuff, which, you know, happens, but, um, you know, but in a place like Detroit, you know, the people working for me are, have you know, families and people to support. And, you know, you have to figure out like how to build a firm that actually is going to support them in a, in a good way. And, on, and well, the other thing, honestly, with the firm was I, I wanted to create an atmosphere where people are not necessarily working 
50, 70, 100 hours a week is ultimately, you know, that burns people out. Yeah. And it, it's not, you know, it's exciting for a while. But, um, and I, I mean, I, you know, I loved it. It was fascinating, but, you know, was it sustainable as a firm? No. I mean, well, I take that back. Yes. If you're, you know, Gary's office or Meyer's office or Caesar's office, that was sort of a given a way of working. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Cause you know, there were competitions, like there were competitions I worked on that were three weeks or five weeks, actually two in a row. They worked a hundred hours a week for eight weeks straight. Um, you know, and, it was totally exciting, you know, exciting. But um, when you start out, you know, we're not getting built up, you know, just yeah. so, um, so. So what are some of the mechanisms that you have in place inside of the business that control or monitor um, the, your kind of production? So in terms of, you know, n- you know, do you go through a process of pre-allocating how much time gets put onto a project at the very outset of a project and how do you establish that and what sorts of things do you, you know, record? Yeah. Uh, I, I, that's, that's a, a big part of what we do. And I think that's probably normal in a lot of firms, um, but um, it's, it's not a science. It's a, it's more of an art form. Um, over the years, I've tried to, you know, find the way. And it's just like, well, it's not out there, you know, but um, so we've, uh, we did it with spreadsheets for years and years and years, you know, it's, it's there's software we're using now, but we, yes, when we do our proposals, we're, we're allocating the time and the schedule and setting deadlines and, and milestones and how many people can work on it. And then we, we track that. Um, so it makes it, really important to be hitting those schedules and deadlines and which is something I learned at all those firms. Like the most important thing is to make the deadline. Like it, you know, so, um, so there's a lot there, but it's just like, how much can you cram into that time allotted? You know, because basically that's how far you are. And that's always, I mean, I'm always pushing, I mean, I, I'm always pushing for a better design and how can we do things faster? Like, is there software like we started working with Revit 10 years ago? So we weren't to try to like consolidate all the different softwares. And um, you know, how can we study things quicker? How can we not overdraw things? You know, because uh, architects we often, often overdraw like more detail than is really needed. What's the what's the detail level that the builder needs? Yes, needs. You know, so I mean, these are all things we've looked at over time to try to um, squeeze out um, time in the process because the more of that we can squeeze out, the more we can put towards design, right? And and but and and you know, if we we have to either make our schedule or at least break even, um, you know, and, and which is a challenge. We're we're definitely better at it now, but, um, yeah, there were a lot of years where, you know, it was breaking even or losing money and, you know, you don't want it. That's just not, not sustainable. You have yeah. to pay people more like, you know, to keep them and to keep talent, you know, it's just reality. There's always bigger firms and other firms that are going to pay more than you are. So, um, how do you make it an atmosphere that people want to work in, mm-hmm. um, which, that really goes back to Caesars and Morphosis because those were the two offices I enjoyed the most. So that process, that process where everyone's in, you know, a part of it. And um, the, the sum is, you know, the, what comes out of it is a sum of everyone working on it. And so it's less about my vision. I want their input. And it's hard. Some people that, you know, they're confronted by that. They're not used to it. Um, shockingly, like it's, you know, you'd think it would be, you know, easy to get people that want to, play, you know, but, um, anyway, um, how, how big is the office nowadays and is, and are you, are you, um, you've got a new partner as well. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Doug McIntosh, my late business partner, my regional business partner, right. 
died, passed away in 2006 of a heart attack. Right. At 44. So we were four. Gosh. And yeah, it was pretty horrible. And, you know, we were 12, 11, 12 years into our practice. Wow. Um, you know, it was, he still owed student loans, um, which <laughs> discovered as a way to get out of paying your student loans. If you pass away, they wipe them out. So just keep putting them off. But <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah, so that was 2006. We were already going into a recession here in Detroit back yeah. then. So, you know, basically had to survive through the, you know, what became the 2008 recession and, you know, into, I don't remember when. And um, so basically I was building up from there running the practice on my own, I started to really lean on um, associates and people in the office to sort of bring them up. And, um, and one of them, John Scope, who's been with me for like 20 years, um, we, you know, he became a partner in, in cup two, three years ago um, and figuring out that process, that transition process, uh, took a long time to set that up, but, um, and now we actually have a, another associate in the office who's just about to become a partner, Lori, Lori Hiller. Um, and, you know, they're like 15 and 20 years younger than me. So, you know, it's, it's intentional. Um, they're, they're sort of the next generation. We're making this into a forever firm. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, somewhat intentional. Plus, you know, what you realize be, being in a city for 25 years, a lot of those people that you were working with have retired or moved on. And then there's a whole bunch of younger people coming in and all of a sudden, you know, you got to keep sort of making yourself known, meeting people. And it's like, well, um, those younger associates are in the mix. So they're able to sort of, keep that sort of newer level coming in their peers um, as clients. And then, you know, where I, I've got sort of the bigger, longer term connections. So it's partly a business um, goal as well. Excellent. How has your leadership evolved since 94 you, and your, and the kind of role that you actually find yourself in today versus what you were doing 30 plus years ago or so? Uh, uh, I like it now more than <laughs> back then, uh, you know, you had, you had to do everything. Uh, when I started working with Doug, it was just Doug and I, we had one employee and then we slowly added people and, you know, it was, it was always a scramble. Like, um, turned out Doug wasn't, I thought he was licensed. He had not passed his licensing. <laughs> You know, I had to scramble to get my reciprocity from California. And then the first year, um, you know, we thought we were doing well. And then it turned out, oh, we'd missed, uh, we'd forgotten about all the employee taxes, you know, like so somehow it got missed between our accountant and us. So that was like, so I had to take over the financial stuff, which I had no idea how to do, but you just have to sort of learn it, right? You have to figure out how to make things work. So basically you're, you're doing everything. And, um, and there's a point where you have to go from doing to managing, you know, other people to do um, and managing, uh, managing other people and then managing managers. So um, it's all a process like, you know, I've been learning for 25 years. So now you know, 25 years later, after really being in the profession for almost 40 years, yeah, there's a lot to sort of, um, you know, help guide the others, not do it for them, but manage, managing managers. So my role is more, more higher, you know, bigger picture, sort of leading the design, but, you know, they're doing it. They're doing the work. You know, we meet much like it was at Caesars, you know, and, and 
we meet, review things and come back. But, you know, I'm not sitting and drawing anymore. Um, that unfortunately stopped years ago. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, but it's, it's, it's interesting. I actually, I mean, I like it a lot and, you know, I'm actually able to, um, you know, enjoy my life a little more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love what I do, but um, are, are you are you still involved <laughs> these days with with say the leadership in the community and the kind of advocacy work? Obviously, Detroit's evolved quite a bit now over the last thirty years. But are you still kind of doing that kind of grassroots type of operations where you're finding sites or finding areas for development and campaigning for it and kind of helping facilitate a conversation for, for regeneration? Not well, somewhat not nearly as much as we did back then because yeah. the city has really evolved and that people are investing in it, like clamoring to buy land and develop. So you don't have to go find those clients now because there are developers out there. Um, you know, looking to do projects. And so they actually, they end up often coming to us now because we've been, we have a history of getting things built in the city and, you know, through a, you know, rough process with the communities, working with the communities and, you know, there's a lot of racial issues and, and there's just a lot of things that you really have to be in tune with the community. Um, and, know the process to get things built and how to build within the budget mm. is Detroit, you know? So how do we build multifamily, you know, mixed use housing for $200 a square foot that in other cities is $400 a square foot, you know, for the same product. So, um, you know, and again, we, we've gotten good at that because we've spent so much time doing it and, um, and it's still an issue, like the market, the rents and the sale prices are still not to the level of, you know, a lot of the bigger cities. And uh, but construction costs are the same, if not more, for whatever reason. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and that's a big challenge. And a lot yeah. of projects would fail because of that. But um, but there's also a lot of wealthier developers who you know, are, are doing things that are willing to pay for stuff. So you know, Dan Gilbert's done a lot. He's, you know, owned, he's worth $40 billion. So, you know, the budget isn't as uh, much an issue for him. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's, so we don't necessarily have to make the projects anymore. That's actually changed. Right. Interesting there, you're saying about um, developing a skill set of being very competent in designing to a kind of price per, per square footage. Now, how does that, because that, and obviously that's a, it's more work, if you like, in a way to be able to, in many cases, to be able to design something which has got more financial constraints. How does that reflect in your fees without, you know, we're doing more work to try and get a building to, work for a lower construction price and often there's this kind of relationship between fees and the total build costs how does that how do you how do you protect that or or balance it well the way we do it is we we get it right the first time like so we design it once and hit the budget right and, and, and now we're going to hit the budget because we're checking it along the way got it um, so we're doing the VE during design, you know, right. so, and uh, honestly, I think it's, it's, uh, it costs us more to go through that whole process, design it, and then find out you're, you know, 30% high. And now you got to start cutting and, you know, we don't necessarily get paid to do things twice. Mm -hmm. Right. So yes. I, I don't necessarily think that's, the way to do it. And I see it happen often. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of how architects work. They come up with this idea and they develop it and everyone's like, Oh yeah, I love that. That's great. And, you know, I look at it and I'm thinking, Oh, you know, they're, you know, they're not going to be able to afford that well, material. They can't. That's, that's really interesting <laughs> because, you know, the, the, the kind of traditional architectural process, if you like, you know, might not have any, fee or or accurate 
kind of uh, cost estimate estimate estimation until there's a an extensive level of detail and drawing production that's been done and by that point you know any kind of redesign is now going to be extraordinarily expensive because the level of detail that things have been have been worked out right so and that's when projects die yes it happen a lot of clients will walk away um so if you want to get it built you know you have to figure out so we're very conscious of the cost of things uh the cost of building not just the material cost but what's the labor that goes into different systems um cuz it turns out the labor is more expensive than the material so you know when we're looking at things with the client it might be oh this material might cost more but it has this way of being installed that will save a lot of labor and a lot of time so we're we're working with the, the contractors along that way and we've done so much of it um you know i'm just always looking for that you know when i go to the ai conventions or other places i'm you know just shopping the floor for products um you know that that can help us do that you know whether it's like fiber cement's been a big one that i've been researching for years and you know we've ended up doing um rain screens for you know with fiber cement and other mid for like 20 years and it was partly out of you know cost um and you know, it turns out it's a good way to build but um you know that was uh finding those those products there's a lot more of them now but you know 15 20 years ago there weren't um and you know that's one example and then right now because of the energy code changes and the exterior insulation like some of those products that we've been using forever like mm-hmm. we're finding the installation process is now complicated because you have to connect back through the insulation and it's like it's adding a lot of cost to systems that we thought were you know affordable before so now we're trying to figure out okay what's how do we get around this like to eliminate that labor because it's adding another $10 a square foot to the skin let's say so um yeah it's you know i mean if we don't then the project won't happen and, yeah you know there's just too much invested in it you know right by us by the client right. yeah the whole the whole team yeah exactly the city i mean you know so i i find it it is challenging but again we're like very keen on costs like you know you know we've got the 20 dollar fixture you know for inside like you know like cuz we know from previous projects like you know contractor would go find some fixture at home depot and it's 20 dollars and we'd be like oh man so we have to go out and find like a much nicer fixture for twenty dollars. Like <laughs> so, you know. But we've done that so many times. We have, you know, we've uh, figured it out. Fantastic. What's in store for the rest of twenty twenty two? So we're we're um, so the Fisher Building we're doing right now, which is a you know great one. It's a huge huge project and undertaking, but very exciting. Um, the we're doing a 450 unit um, new construction multifamily housing in Ann Arbor, and um, and and a, one I'm really excited about is in Colorado, outside of Vail, a 600 um, home community. Um, on it, it, and basically 600 prefabricated houses. Wow. Um, that, you know, we'll sell uh, out there for, you know, 400 to 600,000 with a handful up higher. And that for that market, you know, outside of Vail and Aspen, like that's affordable. Like that's, that's what they need for the people that live there and work there. Um, so, and just figuring out how to, to find someone to do, to build 600 prefabricated houses uh, has been fascinating because um, the it, the industry is just not as far as we think it should be. But we're, we've teamed up with someone now who we think will be really great. Which, by the way, we have to build these houses for you know 
a certain amount and uh, it's challenging because it's, you know, it's like, how do you squeeze it down and still create, you know, great place to live, um, which they will be, uh, but um, within the budget. So they're not million dollar houses. Yeah. If you, if you look at a lot of the prefabricated stuff that's out there, it's high end. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not really any less expensive than stick built. They're just, they're just being, it's maybe, you know, they're using it because it's, a site is hard to get to or whatever, but, um, you know, prefabrication was meant to be less affordable, like less costly, you know what I mean? Like, and so, you know, I'm fascinated by that. Plus I grew up in a prefabricated house designed by Carl Koch, the grandfather of prefab. So it's, it's a, it's, it's interesting that house was built and designed the exact same way that we're doing it now. Only the way we're doing it now, it's going to be built in a factory. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So I, I call it like we're at the Model T level mm-hmm. prefabrication right now. And it's funny, our client <laughs> and was like, no, this is the Tesla model. I'm like, no, for for prefab, this is the model T level. Like this is, they've just figured out how to automate the building process. Like, you know, and there's, there's a handful out there that have done that at this scale. Fascinating. Yeah. So that one's, you know, so it's not necessarily Detroit anymore. And honestly, when we started working here 25 years ago, we thought, you know, at some point it wouldn't be, Detroit, you know, we, we would expand on so and out. So I think, you know, we're doing more of that now. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Michael, I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. What a fascinating journey you've just taken me on. Thank you so <laughs> much for, for, um, for sharing that and your experience and real deep insights there about the, the, the art of regeneration, rebuilding communities, and, you know, the actual core competency of an architect, which is to get stuff built. Yeah. So. It's, it's, I mean, when it comes down to it, uh, it's not architecture until it's built. Yeah. And I, you know, the paper, it's just not. And, um, you know, who said that is Tom Maine. <laughs> <laughs> It's, you know, and yeah, it's about getting the thing built. How do you figure out, you know, how to build it? Yeah. Um, you know, in case it's much more complicated, but, you know, it still has to be done in a budget. And, you know, that's just, you know, higher, but um, it's just a different level. Brilliant. Brilliant. Michael, thank you so much for that. All right. Great. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe 